Welcome to Listen by Jean Ginsberg. This audio experience and podcast is all about social media, digital marketing, entrepreneurship, and interviews with top entrepreneurs in the digital and social space. I am your host, Jean Ginsberg, digital marketing expert, number one best selling author, and award winning entrepreneur. I will be sharing with you strategies, tips, and tactics on how to grow your business and your social media following. Thanks for listening. Hey everyone, Jean Ginsberg here. Welcome to another episode of Listen by Jean Ginsberg. And I have a very special guest today, Malik Parekh. How's it going? Going really well. Thank you for having me, Jean. Really appreciate yes. it. It's great to have you. Uh, we've been coordinating this for a little bit, so I'm very excited. You're on the other side of the world, so that was probably one of the reasons why it took a little bit of time for us to coordinate you being on the podcast. <laughs> well, I wish I was on your part of the world. I lived in uh, Colorado, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, and I loved that experience. It's a beautiful city, yeah. a beautiful part of the U.S. So one of these days, I'll be back and... Uh, you know, breathe in some pristine air. Yes, yes, some good old, some good fresh mountain air. Um, That's right. So usually the first question I ask is always a setting a context and setting the stage for our audiences who are listening, is tell us about your background. Sure, so I grew up in India, uh, lived in the US uh, for almost uh, 20 years. I uh, did my master's in computer science, at least the coursework. And then I worked for a company called Up With People. That's why I actually came to Colorado for the first time. And then I went back and got my MBA from Thunderbird, which is a business school out of Arizona. Uh, after that, I joined uh, Dish Network, one of the largest satellite TV companies in the US. And they actually introduced me to the Philippines. I set up their first international customer care operations here in the country. And I fell in love with this part of the world as well. And eventually in 2006, I moved here um, and ran some large operations. Uh, my last job here was uh, being the CEO of one of the largest uh, business process outsourcing company with uh, some 22,000 employees around the world. I left the job a year ago and uh, was planning to actually go around the world, travel, take a sabbatical with the family, Instead, I got stuck at home like everybody else yeah. and ended up writing my book, which uh, went uh, live November last year. Excellent. So that's a good segue is tell us about your book. Yeah, it's, uh, it's called uh, Future Proof Your Career and Company. And it's about how to flourish in an era of uh, artificial intelligence, digital natives and the gig economy. And what it covers is that uh, while we are all focused on COVID-19 situation, uh, many of us have taken eyes off of what's happening on the horizon. You know, some of the underlying trends uh, and uh, some of the forces that are gaining momentum, gaining strength. You know, one of the recent studies done by McKinsey mentioned that up to 375 million jobs are at risk because of AI and automation over the next 10 years. Uh, by 2030, two thirds of our global workforce will be made up of uh, digital natives, uh, millennials and Gen Zers. And the gig economy is growing rapidly. By 2027, there is um, a survey done that uh, they're expecting some 50% uh, of the US workforce will be involved in uh, freelancing. And we are not talking about people who are driving for Uber or delivering pizza at home. Uh, we are talking about highly skilled professionals who are turning to the freelancing lifestyle, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I actually love this topic because I, I'm a futurist. I look, uh, I always love talking about what's coming up around the corner. I love technology. And so what, what's the big picture, right? So uh, lots of AI coming up on the mark. I mean, just in the marketplace, you know, maybe not directly to consumers yet, but something yes. that is going to be happening very much in the near future. So where do you think that jobs will be um, in the next five to 10 years? Sure. So, you know, I write extensively about that in the book. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the first topics that I tackle and a question that I get asked all the time is, uh, will AI take my job? And uh, <laughs> if your uh, job or any of the tasks that you do within your job belongs to one of the three categories, then you are at risk of potentially losing your job. Number one, if you're doing something that is boring, predictable, and repetitive, 
then I can assure you over the next 10 years, uh, you will see the impact of AI in your life. The second thing I always share with people is that uh, if what you do has a very specific objective and there is a large set of data that you can train AI algorithm with, then AI can do your job. So, you know, last year Google Health announced that its AI algorithm did a better job reading mammograms than uh, trained experienced human professionals. So they were able to train AI algorithm on how to read mammograms, how to re uh, read x-rays and so on and so forth. And the third thing to keep in mind is that if your job only involves basic cognitive skills like learning, uh, predicting, reasoning, then that part of your job could be done by AI. A lot of the recommendation that we see on Netflix, for example, or Amazon are all done by AI, right? So the next question, obviously, is then what would be left for humans? Mm -hmm. Well, we have some really interesting and uh, very strong benefits or inherent advantages against AI. Number one, only we can create something out of nothing. Uh, AI doesn't have the ability today to create something out of nothing. You know, we can watch a sunset and be inspired to write a poem or to paint a masterpiece. AI doesn't have that ability to do that. Uh, AI maybe doesn't have maybe not yet, but maybe not the... yet. <laughs> and again, uh, so uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, the, the book that I wrote is with the horizon of 10 years, right? right. Um, at 20, 30 years when the singularity happens that uh, they're expecting, you know, AI may perhaps do most of what we do today better than us. Uh, but at least for the next 10, 20 years, I think we have an edge against AI when it comes to creativity. When it comes to thinking out of the box and being holistic when you're looking at a, a situation. So, for example, imagine if AI was the CEO or a president of a country when the COVID-19 situation hit us all. Uh, it would be completely at loss because only humans have the ability to think strategically and holistically about a problem. Only humans today have the ability to be adaptable and be resourceful in a situation. Uh, AI cannot. Uh, AI is a one trick pony. You can teach her to be the best chess champion and it will do that really well. But if you say, well, you know, can you learn what you learn from the chess game and tell me how should I maneuver through my chess game that's played out in the boardroom? It won't be able to help you with that. So those are some of the advantages that we have against AI that we can uh, definitely hone and strengthen. Yes, for now, for now, this is all. I, I love yes. how we're talking about this now because, but, the, but you know, how how far is the future ahead, right? And right. I um, had a I have an interesting story because uh, I do love, like I said, listening about the stuff and learning about AI and technology. And um, I follow someone. Uh, I don't know if you know Peter Diamandis. Have you heard That's of right. him? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And he so believes was... in singularity yes. and, uh, <laughs> and with I... Ray Kurzweil, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. And yeah. and his message really, you know, is he talks a lot about the things that I care about, like longevity and, and AI and technology. Yes. And um, I was watching one of his uh, summits. Um, I don't know. I think this was a couple years ago, from a couple years ago. And one, he he was, you know, had a speech, and then at the end, he had took some questions. And one of the questions was from an, a surgeon. He's like, I'm a, you know, I'm actually training to be a surgeon right now, and I, you know. And he was uh, he asked a question about like where do you think the surgeon position is going to go in the future and and uh peter was like you're not you know in the future there are not going to be any surgeons because people are going to be like i don't want a human touching me i want like a machine to <laughs> to yes. do my surgery that you you know the machine has done thousands of times and doesn't have a shaky hand <laughs> and didn't have any drinks last night so it's it's funny how you know i mean this is obviously all related to the future of work right because surgeons are not going to exist anymore right <laughs> either yeah in the Future, and so most of the, uh, you know, specialized uh, fields would not exist, you know, legal, for example, there are incredible uh, amount of research going on. Some companies are doing great work, uh, which has basically put a lot of the paralegals out of work in the US, because yeah. what paralegals would do could be done easily by AI, much better, faster and cheaper. Right. Uh, once yeah. you invest in the technology, I think the key thing is to your point, uh, keeping in mind the horizon. So Peter is absolutely right. Uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now, who knows what will happen to us. But if somebody's thinking about today and for the next 10 years, this new decade, how do we ensure that we have the edge? How do we ensure we thrive in the next 10 years? Then one of the things that we need to do better is become human you know, uh, really strengthen some of the human skills and inherent advantages that we have against AI. 
Right. And one of the things that Peter did mention in that speech he was talking about is that he believes that even AI is going to tell better jokes in the future than, than we can. <laughs> so he's like, he actually asked that question. Yeah. He's like, who do you, th- who in the audience thinks this is before COVID? He's like, who in the audience thinks that, you know, only humans can create jokes and, you know, half the people yes. raise their hands. And then he's like, who do you, th- how many people think that AI can create better jokes? And I was like, I think eventually AI, again, this is in the future. This is probably not in the next 10 years, but eventually yes. I think, even even better jokes. So that's an interesting point. So, um, yeah. and the next question I have is, um, <clears throat> what are the traits of a successful company in the future? So now we're getting on the topic of, you know, of course, AI and, and changing how work and the future of work is. This podcast is brought to you by the Digital Marketing Method Monthly Group Coaching Program, your methodology for growing your business and your social media following. Join me and my group of supportive entrepreneurs and learn how you can grow your business and your social media following where we cover topics such as Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, email marketing, and so much more. Go to dmgroup.online, dmgroup.online. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, one of the first things companies have to do to thrive over the next 10 years, at least, is to ensure they are digitally transforming themselves every single day. Uh, Second thing they must have to do is to have a a strong purpose that goes beyond the profit and loss um, because they need to, one way or the other, attract young generations. And today's young generations are some of the Uh, most woke people that we have come across. Uh, They deeply care about what kind of world we live in, how we solve the problems of the world, leave uh, the environment better for the next generation than what we have inherited. So it's important that companies need to have a very strong purpose. The third thing companies need to do is to create a culture of innovation. Uh, And typically, you know, people think that uh, creating a culture of innovation means, hey, let's just take our C-suite to the Silicon Valley, spend a week there, go to Napa Valley, drink some wine and come back. And wow, you know, we are all very innovative. That's not how it works. So you have to really create a culture that permeates throughout the organization. It's a mindset. It's not a technology that you need to go out and buy. Uh, The fourth thing you have to do is to ensure that you create a culture of lifelong learning, you know. Days, uh, those days are gone when, uh, you know, the last thing you look at the resume is, okay, where, where did your degree come from? And then we stop learning and uh, educating ourselves. Now we live in a world where all of us, uh, starting with the CEOs down to the janitors, will all have to keep learning uh, how the world is changing. Because um, according to a recent survey, uh, the half-life of a skill has now gone down to five years. So within five years, uh, half of the skills that you know today would be irrelevant. So how do you ensure that you will be relevant in the next five years? And the the fifth thing I write about in the book is that you have to create a culture of fun, adventure, and excitement for your employees because the life would be very tough. Life would be extremely stressful in the business for the next 10 years. So how do you ensure that you retain your employees? Uh, It's up to the leaders to ensure that create an energy and um, create a culture of expedition. So 20 years from now, when the employees look back and say, my God, you know, working for that company was the best part of my life. That was the journey of a lifetime, not a biggest nightmare that kept happening every single week. Right, right. Absolutely. So I'd love to read your book. I have not read it yet, but I definitely am going to put it on the list because, um, of course, I love talking about this stuff. But um, earlier you mentioned, of course, you know, you took some time, you were going to take some time off and travel the world, but you got stuck at home like everyone else, um, right? And then you wrote a book, but during COVID, and then what do you, you know, what has been the change? Like if, since COVID began, of course, we had a certain plan a year ago or a little bit over yeah. a year ago, but then uh, in the industry, how has the industry or future of work even maybe changed? I mean, I think it accelerated the future of work COVID did, but what are your thoughts yes. on that? No, absolutely. I think uh, companies came to terms with uh the fact that digital transformation is not a nice to have, but it's a must have. You know, yeah. Domino's Pizza, who have gone through digital transformation for the last 12 years, they didn't wait for COVID-19 to happen to resume that process. They have been doing that for the last 12 years, had their best year in 2020. Their revenue and margins increased by double digit compared to 2019, you know, despite the pandemic. Whereas Pizza Hut, 
company mm-hmm. in the same industry, yeah. the parent company of Pizza Hut filed for bankruptcy. Why? Because one company had embraced digital transformation before they needed it. And Pizza Hut uh, had to eventually close the door or you know go through that bankruptcy uh, proceedings that they're going through right now. So one of the things that we all have learned is that digital transformation is a must. We all must have that uh, as part of our uh, repertoire. I think the second thing people have realized that, um, you know, it's uh, overestimated the need for us to all to be gather. Uh, companies can survive uh, when a lot of us can work from home. And yes, it's important to have people once in a while come together and have face to face meeting. But we live in a day and an age where um, companies actually don't need to have massive investments in physical spaces. Uh, they can create an environment where their employees can have their cake and eat it too. Because at the end of the day, if they don't do it, then your employees have a potential and have a chance to become a freelancer. Mm-hmm. And what does freelancer do? You know, they can work from anywhere. Uh, they can decide to do anything they want. Uh, they, they can decide to wear anything they want to wear while they're working. And th- that's a competition that um, companies have to keep in mind. Of course, yeah. So you mentioned, of course, digital transformation as part of what's been going on in the last year. I mean, it's been going on for a while, but it's definitely accelerated in the last year. But why do you think that most companies fail at digital transformation and how do you avoid that? Well, um, you know, there was a study done that uh, 84% of the companies who took on digital transformation over the last 20 years uh, failed to achieve the sustainable results. And the number one reason um, the companies fail is because they equate buying technology to transforming themselves. Uh, That's not the case. Uh, Digital transformation is actually not going out and buying the latest and the greatest technology everybody's talking about at a convention that you attended. It's about uh, deciding what your ultimate goal is. And there are three key goals for any digital transformation. It all starts with begin with, you know, end in mind. What's the end here? Number one, how do you improve and enhance customer experience? So your digital transformation has to be about enhancing your customer experience. The second thing your digital transformation has to do is about uh, enhancing your employee experience. And the third thing the digital transformation has to do is to answer this question. Do we need to revamp our business model or not, given everything that's happening around us? So if you start with this end in mind, you will have the right strategy in place. And then the four things that you need to do to ensure the digital transformation is done right is uh, ensure that CEO is the one driving it. It's not CIO's job to drive digital transformation because it's about strategy. It's not about technology. So that's number one. Second thing, uh, people need to know why you are doing it. Uh, If your employees don't know why you're going through this massive transformation, they would never get on the bandwagon. They would never drink the same Kool-Aid that uh, you're drinking. The third thing you have to do is to coordinate. You need to make sure that at the sea level, everybody is coordinated on what needs to happen for this digital transformation. And at the rank and file level, you need to have a project team that's driving this one step at a time. It's just, uh, it's like the M- MPV model that uh, startup uh, follow, right? Uh, the minimum viable product. Mm-hmm. How do you ensure that you are taking one bite at a time instead of chewing more than, uh, you know, or taking on more than you can chew? Right. So those are some of the things that you have to keep in mind to ensure that you succeed, you succeed in digital transformation. Absolutely. Yes, it's so true. And it's the ones that don't do it are going to be left behind. Right. And that's how businesses fail and go bankrupt is because they just aren't there with the times. Right. I mean, we've seen this so much happening in the last you know, 10, 20. I mean, it happens for all the time, but even more so, I think it's been accelerating in the last 10 or 20 years because uh, technology has been accelerating itself so, so right. quickly. So, yeah. Um, and then the last question before we wrap up is, I love asking this question because it is a, it's a very open-ended question, is what is your prediction for the future? And of course, we talked about future of work, but it can also be terraforming Mars or self-driving cars, or, you know, maybe you can talk more about the future of work. So it's totally, totally open-ended. <laughs> Well, you know, my, my take is more personal, actually, and it's uh, something that is close to everyone's heart. Uh, I think we live in the golden age of work. Um, we live in a world today that if you have a song in you, 
you, it doesn't need to die in the nine to five rat race that we had no choice but to do in the past. Uh, there are so many opportunities to make a living now and follow your dreams, follow your passion and uh, make a living. Um, I think the biggest change that will happen and it's going to transform the way the world works is how freelancing will allow people to reclaim their freedom even during Monday to Friday. Think about it. Why do we say TGIF and not TGIM? Why do we say, thank God it's Friday? Nobody says, oh my God, thank God it's Monday. I'm, I can't wait to get to work. I, I do, I sometimes are, say okay. that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you are an exception, not the you know, rule. So yes. it's because we lose some of the freedom we have during Monday to Friday, but freelancing offers that now. And uh, in order for companies to compete against that, they would need to create that environment at the workplace that promotes entrepreneurship, that promotes freedom, uh, that promotes uh, opportunities for people to follow their dreams and for create their own customized career paths. Yes, that's so true. It's, that's the future is not just, not just a nine to five, but actually finding something that, that is purposeful, right? That actually means something to you personally um, and creating, a job or a freelance um, gig out of it. So I, um, I love what I love that. And I love what you're saying. So um, great. So last question, of course, always is how can our audiences get in touch with you or find your book? Well, um, the book is available on Amazon, um, so you can obviously buy it. Um, I just completed my audio book. It should be going uh, on sale in the next couple of weeks. So if people want to you know fall asleep listening to an indian <laughs> accent uh, then i have an i have a solution for you um but you can also uh, check out my website uh, maulikparek.com and uh, you will see all my social media handles there and uh, it'd be great to have you tag along as i continue this journey great thank you this has been great i love talking about the stuff i actually had a couple of people on the podcast who talked about the future of work and i this is a topic that i think about very often, you know, what's going to be happening in the next five to 10 years and how, how are the machines going to take over our jobs? So thank you so much for being here. Malik Parekh, the uh, Future Proof, Your Career and Company is the book. And uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Jane, for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.